Next, on the OHIO podcast, we wrap up the season by talking about the disappointing loss in the NCAA tournament and whether or not Chris Holtman should be on the hot seat as we move into next season. Also, we talk about the role that social media plays in our fandom. And all of that starts right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. To hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? I'm proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who wins. It's time for the best Buckeye podcast by fans for the fans where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO podcast. OHIO! And welcome back to the OHIO podcast. I am your host, Buckeye Boggs, recording live from a wet and soon to be windy central Ohio. I am joined by my two co hosts tonight, who the wind is blowing into my sails. Okay, that was really bad. <laughs> that, was, that didn't go as well as I thought. Chris Wilds from Marion. How's it going, Chris? I'm oh, doing great up here. Yeah, that wind's a whipping around. It's already taking down a couple trees up here. So. Whoa. Oh, yeah, it's been good. So nothing's hit the house, so that's a positive. There you go. And down in the Queen City, soon to be Windy City of Cincinnati, Nick Delanitis. How's it going tonight, Nick? Doing great, man. Doing great. All right, guys, as promised on our last episode, episode 142, where we talked football, it's time to wrap up this basketball season. And that is exactly what we're going to do on this podcast. We are going to talk about what was a very disappointing early exit from the NCAA tournament by our Buckeyes, who lost 75 to 72 to Oral Roberts. Sounds like a dentist. It is not. It is actually a university. They're the Golden Eagles of Oral Roberts somewhere, I believe. I think it's Tulsa, if I'm not mistaken. Tulsa. Yeah, I think Tulsa. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, Ohio State loses in overtime to Oral Roberts in the first round. They became, become one of a handful of upsets that, were, that was a number two seed that got upset by a number 15 seed in the NCAA tournament. So we can now check that box off, I guess, as Buckeye fans. Uh, we're going to talk about that game. We're going to talk about the conclusion of that game, what happened after that game, and what role social media plays in our fandom. We're going to get on into that. We're also going to talk a little bit about next year, um, as well as Chris Holtman and the roster that will be coming back that we anticipate for Ohio State. But let's begin first with the game. Obviously, it was disappointing. It was somewhat surprising. But given what we saw during the regular season, I can't say that I was completely shocked by what happened. Nick, I'll start with you. Your reaction of Ohio State losing by three points in overtime to a dentist school, Oral Roberts. Um, initial reaction was really like this is, you know, like I, I just I, I just couldn't believe it. Um when I was watching the big 10 tournament and this is like the thought that ran into my head, as soon as that buzzer hit zero, we, and that we, I saw like the two missed threes. I said, I thought came back to me when I was watching the big 10 tournament. I said to my dad, I said, we are pulling these out now, but in March, you never want to use your luck too early. And I and we played with Lady Luck early in March, and it didn't pay off late in March. Um, I mean, it, just watching that game, 
it was just kind of rough. I we went away from a lot of what we did in the early in the early parts of the season. Um, like when I was watching us early in the season, like those first like games against Iowa and stuff, we did a lot of high pick and roll, getting shooters, you know, getting EJ Lydell look nice, easy looks at the basket, you know, causing some misma- mismatches on you know on for, on the on the opposing defense. And we just, it seemed like we went a lot away from that and went to more of ISO play. And when we were going with pick and roll as our offense, we were able to get easy twos and stop runs. And that's when I noticed when we played Oral Roberts that we we couldn't stop their runs. Yeah, uh, defensively, this team was definitely... They were they were flawed, they were flawed defensively, and that definitely caught up with the Buckeyes, no doubt about that. Um, Chris, yeah. your initial reaction, man. Well, I think you know a little bit about my initial reaction. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was it was it, it, it was initially I was pretty angry at, at first, but you know what? There were some people who actually predicted this, um, and. and you know, the first initial reaction is to kind of look for somebody to blame. And, you know, we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. So, But I think there was a little bit of blame to go around. Uh, first of all, I don't think the team looked 100% prepared. Maybe it was coming off of a tough Big Ten tournament. Maybe it was underestimating Wall Roberts. You know, one of the things that really stood out to me was the fact that um, we didn't really, as um, Nick had pointed out, you know, we should have had an advantage on the inside, and we really didn't take advantage of that. Um, we set up for a lot of bad jump shots. Uh, the team just looked out of sync to me. Uh, we got pulled into playing a pace that favored um, Oral Roberts. I believe that defensively we weren't equipped to handle uh, Adm- uh, Admus. It wasn't so much from the shooting standpoint because we knew about his shooting. But, man, when we came out to defend on that perimeter, his quickness just stood out to me so much. He just beat everybody off the dribble the minute we came out to cover him on the perimeter. You know, additionally, uh, you know, Kevin uh, Banner, who really was a solid player through most of the season, had 19 points, nine and a half boards a game. He just has become Herculean in the tournament, as both Ohio State and Florida found out. You know, he's averaging 29 points, 11 boards a game. And he's just created a nightmare matchup for, for both teams he's faced so far. So, you know, I do think we had a lack of preparedness. I, I think we got away from our game plan. Um, individually, you know, we're, again, we'll talk about what happened with, with Liddell later. But, you know, he, he was playing exhausted. He was playing through pain. He still managed to knock out 23 points, 14 boards, and five assists, 10 of 15 shooting. You know, Washington, uh, 18 points, 10 boards. I felt like he played out of control. Um, And we've seen that, you know, a few times this year. I think he played out of control. He pressured, and his shot selection was not that great. Um, Walker, I thought, was fairly solid. But, you know, outside of that, we didn't get a lot from the supporting cast. And a stat that really stands out, something we've done very well all year, which is free throw shooting. We only shot 50%. Um, from behind the arc, we only hit 21.7%. So, you know, I, I think there was a lot of things that went wrong in the game. But let's not also, you know, also not dismiss the fact that Oral Roberts came in with a game plan. They paid, played one hell of a game, and they shot lights out. Even though Ohio State actually held them below their, their season averages on shooting percentage and three-point percentage. Chris, was... Uh... Coach Holtman outcoached in this game. I believe he was. Nick, do you think he was outcoached? No. Okay. I, I, I don't. I'll tell you why. Eight missed free throws. That's not being outcoached. That's legs. Eight missed free throws. Okay, so so let's try to find a reason behind this. You're pointing out a very good statistic. I, I feel you, Nick. I got you. So did our run through the Big Ten tournament hurt us? 
in the NCAA tournament. Because Chris and I kind of mentioned that there was a show, Chris. We were talking about that. We a were, bit, especially uh, with the extra game. Mm-hmm, a big run through the tournament might hurt you. I don't. Was so, that it, Nick? So here's my opinion. I don't think it. I, I think that was. Okay. That was 40% of it. Okay. 40% of it. Good. Our I like this. You're giving me percentages. I love percentages. Awesome. The, six, the other 60 happened the minute Kyle Young had a concussion. Mm. He's bringing some stats, Chris. I like it. That, that's listen. true. I mean, listen. And, and people, people who listen could be like, ah, I, I, you know, does it really matter? Let me tell you something. Kyle Young gives us not only rotation depth at, as in our big men, he plays a lot of minutes, he doesn't foul, he goes after every loose ball, and he's a rebounding machine. And but, before he got that concussion, he was draining open threes was, left and right. He was. He was playing out of his mind. But we so, still beat Michigan without him, and we went to overtime with Illinois. Correct. But when we need, like, okay, correct. You're, you're not, and, and you're right. Correct. But why I say that was 60% that, because in that game against Oral Roberts, that's 60% Kyle Young not being there. I, that's what I'm saying. Like, I might, I can, you, you, I can, I can go with that. I, I, I kind of can follow you on that, Nick. I'm not going to argue that, that point. Game, in that game, and I'm just speaking like leading up to the Oral Roberts game, it's 60% Kyle Young not there. 40% our legs because if Kyle Young is there, we have different rotation of players who are not as tired going into the Oral Roberts game who are now fresher for that replacement and those time periods that they need to play, especially when we did get in foul trouble. Okay. Chris, you and, want to respond to that? Well, and I definitely respect that view and I agree. Kyle, Kyle not being there was huge. Um, and I honestly think were he in there, um, Ohio State would have had a better chance, somebody who matched up a little bit better, I think, with O'Banion. However, you know, injuries are part of the game. The fact is, even, even without Young, you have to learn how to coach without your players, you know. And I think that while Young being out hurt, I think the bigger bigger issue was the fact that we allowed ourselves to be pulled out of playing our style of ball. And I think that we also didn't really take a good advantage of matchups when we did have them. And that, to me, is more an issue with coaching than it is with the actual players that are on the floor at the time. All right. Here, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw something at you. And, Nick, I think I might be able to change your percentage a little bit here. I coached high school basketball. Chris, who was, who was Ohio State's best player that day against Oral Roberts? Who was our number one guy? Well, you know, point, points-wise, it was EJ. Okay, that's all I wanted to hear. Nick, was EJ our best player that day? See, the, you know where I'm going I, with I, this, don't you? I, I see. Here's my thing: is is best is not always what I because because I want to say it was Washington Junior. And you would be wrong best. because he scored 18 points, eight of which happened in the first two minutes, and then he grew he grew he was cold the rest of the game. He was lukewarm at best. Well, As a basketball coach, when you have the when you have the ball. In a tied in a tied game or down by a, a shot, and you have a timeout, okay? It is your job as a coach to draw up a play to get the ball in the hands of your best player with options, meaning he can go score or he draws attention to himself and then can kick it out to someone else um, for the game-winning shot. A la Michael Jordan, anybody? I mean, how many times did he win that uh, championships doing that, right? So 
What did I mean? The literally dribble the ball, Washington go shoot. I mean, what what is that? That's coaching, dude. Yeah. That was that was coaching. You've got to at least give me twenty five percent that he got out coached. <sighs> Washington was cold, man. His legs were gone. They were gone. He started hot, but as that game went on, everything see, was See, and, and here, like, as a fan, I agree with you. I would just really like to know what, what play Chris Holman drew up, though. Well, if he – that's true. Did he, he draw something else, else up in Washington and try to play hero ball? That is a possibility. That's, but it, it sure it, didn't look like that, though, Chris. It looked right. like, no, no, hey, I want you to like dribble that. the ball till till the last second and you take the shot. Now, here's what Chris Holtman might have been thinking. And if he says this, if he ever asks that question, he has a, he has an out. And that is this. Hey, how many times did EJ turn the ball over in the, la- in the, in the last two minutes of a basketball game with, when the basketball was in his hands? I didn't want it in his hands because I didn't want to turn the ball over. If that's I true, which is an answer, then that means EJ has some serious flaws in his game. He's not your best player. So when you say you say Washington, there are times, Nick, I might agree with you. But in this game, Washington had no legs left. If you can get the ball down to EJ with five seconds left on the clock on the block, they're going to swarm him and double team him. He's either A, going to get fouled or B, someone is going to be wide open. So, okay. So question for you then, Eric. Okay. Question for you. Are you more or less disappointed in the shot selection that Washington had? The step back three? I'm, I'm disappointed in the play. I think it was a, okay. I think it was a terrible play. It was, it was uncreative. You should have something as a coach in your back pocket that you can draw up for a game-winning shot. You got to have four or five of those ready. He had nothing. Did you did you know did you know that he was one of the best um, two-point shooters, jump shooters in the country this year? And Who, like Washington you know, like, or Washington? Yeah, he was like one of the top in like the like in the yeah, country. That, that's that's great, but he wasn't so, on that day. And as a no, coach, right. you have to understand the situation of the game and the players and what they're going right. through. Here's another one well, for you. I think this is completely coaching well, right here. Musa Jalo, Musa Jalo played 32 minutes and gave you three points. Now I understand he's a defensive specialist, but a, a defensive specialist should never play 32 minutes in a basketball game. He offered you nothing offensively. Nothing. That's that's coaching. You got to get off that, man. That is coaching. That is coaching. Uh, but Eric, at the same time, how much of that goes back to Nick's argument of Kyle Young? Oh, I, right. a, a ton, a ton of it. That's why I said Nick can convince me with that. I thought that was a really good point, Nick, that Kyle mm-hmm. Young would have played a big difference in that game. But he he. He wasn't. He couldn't. And they had proved to me in the Michigan and Illinois games the week before that they could win without him. They had to get through that game, and then there was a good chance he would come back. Question for you. Yeah. Michigan has Rivers. Do we win that game without Kyle Young? (sighs) Probably not. Okay. Probably not. So, but Michigan is proving even without their quote unquote best player quote unquote, what that they're doing. Right. right now they're carrying yeah. they're carrying the Big Ten. The Big Ten and let's talk about that for a second. Was the Big Ten <laughs> overrated, Chris? You know, I don't want to sound like an SEC fan, but I'm going to when I when I say this. I don't know whether the Big Ten was overrated or whether we just beat the hell out of each other all the way through the season and at the end of the season they were just tired. That's, um, that's that's a lame excuse, even though you're giving it to me, and I know that's the SEC thing to do in the football. SEC thing. But but no, the but SEC at least wins half of their bowl games, dude. Yeah, they <laughs> they are they are. I, I think that the Big Ten was somewhat overrated this year. Yeah, I but at the were. same time, I think a lot of that comes from 
the other conferences were down and we knew it and look at what the Big Ten's doing. Um, you know, we didn't have a fabulous year out of Carolina and Duke and, and Kentucky, yeah, Kentucky, Kentucky. Uh, all these teams that we're used to seeing there. It's like, oh, wow, well, look at the Big Ten. These guys are just putting up phenomenal numbers and they're, they're battling each other in great games every night. I think, yeah, I do think there was some overrating there. Nick, Big Ten overrated? Yeah. <laughs> I think so, too. I'm not. Yeah. I, you know what? It, like, let's just be honest here. We had the best team in the country. We had another. We had another team in the team up north who was very has the potential. Who had the potential at the start of the tournament to win it all. Iowa had the potential to do it. Ohio State did, and then, I mean, it, and it just all fell apart. I mean, there. I, what else do you call it when there's one team remaining and you have five out of the nine teams you put in there who have potentials to win this thing? You know what, though? Let, let me ask you this, though, too. Does it matter that Michigan played so many fewer games? Yeah. I mean, just because of the legs ar- leg argument, not tired legs. But in all fairness, and I will say this in all fairness to the Big Ten in this case, well, let's just remember the rules here of the tournament. One positive COVID test, your team is automatically done. You know what I mean? Like, because of constant yeah. tracing rules and all that. So, like, you know, who's to say that we do beat Oral Roberts and then we have a positive test and then we're done the next round to, due to, like, not even losing a game? You know, I mean. Well, I can tell so, you this. The the I I I was I've worked I worked in Indiana this week. I drove right through Indianapolis, right by, you know, the arenas. They've got a bubble around this thing, dude. Oh yeah. It, it's 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 like it's they've got more security than Fort Knox going on, man. It's something else actually. So um <clears throat> was it kind of cool to see actually? Like knowing no, that like no, there, there was there was there's there's really nothing there that mentions it. It's just all blocked off. That's it. There's hardly any signs. There's hardly any fanfare. Everything is just normal as could be outside of the city. And then when you get down close to the arena, it's all blocked off. That's it. It, it really doesn't look like the, a celebration of a college tournament at all. There's nothing mentioning it. Wow. Just a few sign- yeah. I mean, there's more for the Big Ten championship game, like 10 times more. Yeah, it's oh. it's weird. It's really weird. So I just hope we get back to Indy in December. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. All right, let's let's move on here. Yeah. I think we've done a good job of talking about the game. We've ta- done a good job of, of placing blame. Let's let's talk a little bit before we take a commercial break and come back with the EJ Liddell stuff. Let's talk a little bit about this team in the season they had. I made the comment that I felt like Ohio State overachieved a little bit this year. Given what their expectations were coming into the season, there was a lot of question marks. I remember Chris and I, we talked about this. We're not really sure what kind of team we have. I feel we have no center, and I feel like we're weak at the point guard position. And that could spell, you know, the disaster. But there was also some, like, Positive question marks in like Seth Towns. How much would he be able to offer? Justice Suing was be, was going to be able to play this year. By the way, he had a terrible game against Oral Roberts too. Thirty four minutes and seven points, two rebounds. Um, EJ Liddell became a, a bona fide Big Ten and future All American. Uh, that's a positive. They overachieved by not only what they did inside the conference, I feel like, but then the the run they had at the very end going to overtime in the Big Ten Championship game and tournament, only to fall flat on their face in the first round of the NCAA tournament. That being said, did Ohio State reach the – did they reach their potential this year, or did they go over – did they overachieve or did they underachieve, Chris? Uh, You know – I, I I still think they overachieved for what our expectations were. Um, I think that they they did probably 
I, I would say that they have not yet reached their full potential, but I think they overachieved for where we thought they would be. Okay, that's fair. Nick? Uh, sorry, I, I, I'm trying to think of exactly how to word what I'm trying to say. And I, mean, and I was like thinking about it the entire time, and I still can't quite come up with it. But It's hard, I, isn't it, Nick? I mean, yeah, it's, because you want to say, like, yes, they overachieved, but at the but same we, time, after watching them achieve what they did, you feel like they underachieved. Yes, right. Because, and but it's like also for multiple different reasons. Like, like I feel like in a non-COVID year, this would have felt like a way over achievement. You know what I mean? Like, just and not saying like COVID or like using that because like like I'm like sick of it and everything. But like to me, it was just there was so much like you know Michigan State was out for two weeks. You know, and there was like Duke was out for like how long and all that stuff. You know what I mean? So I feel when you look at ranking wise, I feel like we overachieved. Um, and where we underachieved was, I think that looking at how they came together, like at that midpoint in the season when we were like, when we were making that run and every, and we were all thinking, whoa this could be a national championship team if, if they keep playing this way and they, and they keep improving, you know, that this, this team looks like they could win it all. That's where they underachieved to me. It, it just looked like we hit that peak and then it was just a downhill slow slide from there. Yeah. Yeah. It, does does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. I mean, does that make sense guys? Yeah. And then, and then the tournament, the, in the big 10 tournament, all of a sudden they brought it, all those good feelings back to you. And so you believed again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just kind of like, it was like, okay. Oh uh-huh. yes. Oh, this team looks like we're going to win it all. Ooh. Okay. So we split against this team. Okay. No, no worries. Oh, oh, here we go. Now we're in our losing streak, big 10 tournament. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, never mind. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of, it was a little bit of a roller coaster there. Um, right. And I think EJ Liddell kind of he kind of put it he worded it very well in saying, "Look, we have sacrificed so much of our social lives to do what we did this year in order to stay COVID free." Um, which kind of leads into what we're going to talk about after the commercial break. And and he just admitted we're like we're tired we're tired of like not being able to talk to our families hug our families be around our families be around our friends who are outside of the basketball program you know go to going to class going to parties just being social um it wore on those guys and it, I mean I thought that they gave a, a great effort this season no doubt about it and that need that should be uh, recognized. And I thought you said it just right, Nick, that 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 should be recognized. And I agree, Chris, they did overachieve to our expectations. But that being said, we can't ignore the fact that in year number, I think this is year number four of Chris Holtman, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. He hasn't won anything, guys. I mean, he finished second his first year. Then he was like five and like like mediocre at best in the Big Ten for two years. And he finished fifth last year. He finished fifth again this year, believe it or not, even though we seem to be doing much better until that that losing streak at the end. Finished fifth in the Big Ten standings again. Did make it to the Big Ten championship game in the tournament. i got to give him credit for that, but he didn't win it. He hasn't won anything. Going into his fifth year next year, Chris, is Chris Holtman on the hot seat? Well, you know, I – I've looked at the same things you have. You know, he's got an 87 and 43 record at Ohio State. He's got um, 20 wins in all four seasons. He has been to the dance six the last seven years. Only one uh, he missed was the COVID uh, canceled year. Um, he has made a run at a Big Ten title, but I just said he hasn't won anything. Um, he's got. Some decent recruiting wins, but his recruiting hasn't been exactly lights out either. No. Uh, so we're going to talk about that you know, in a second too. Yeah, I really think that um, this season is going to be a make it or break it season for him. 
I, Nick. I think he's definitely on the hot seat. Okay, Nick, is Chris Holtman on the hot seat, brother? His seat's on fire. Really? You think Look, he's really hot, huh? If I'm Gene, if, if I'm our athletic director first, going, I'm, I'm letting Chris Holtman and the boys have their time with their family and everything. But when he, when we're coming back and we're talking basketball, I'm looking at him and I'm saying, if you do not get a first round buy. Uh, if you're not one of the top four teams in the big in the Big Ten this year, you don't you were not in the Big Ten championship because you know stuff happens in the game, shots don't fall. You can't you can't fault a coach for that. But getting there and putting yourself putting your team in a position to win does matter to me at least. And you better make a deep run in the NCAA tournament while you're gone. So if you guys – if you go back – let's go back in the time machine here five years ago, and Ohio State is looking for a new basketball coach at an odd time, mind you, to look for one. And we all wanted Archie Miller. Do you remember that? I mean we all were calling Archie Miller from Dayton, right? Indiana swoops in, takes Archie, and then Ohio State has the – coaching change like right after that we're all like are you kidding me you could have had archie and then he goes and gets chris holtman now let's fast forward four years later archie miller's a disaster at indiana i mean an absolute train wreck he he's he's gone he's fired it looks like between those two candidates gene smith kind of gets lucky with chris holtman here because chris holtman coaches circles around archie miller right now but that being said i'm with you chris not not so much with you, Nick. I, I think his, his seat is hot. I don't think it's on fire, but it's definitely warming up. And I think next year is a make-or-break year for Chris Holtman. I believe that. He's got to at least finish in the top two or three in the Big Ten during the regular season. And I think he needs to make another run in the Big Ten tournament. And he definitely needs to make it to the Sweet 16 in the NCAA tournament. Especially when you look at the roster he's going to have probably coming back next year. Right. That being said, Chris, you mentioned it. Recruiting. He's not been a bad recruiter. But he's not been a great recruiter either. In fact, his best recruit that he's going to pull in as the coach of Ohio State. I mean, EJ Liddell's a good one. That was a... That was a good win for him because that was Mr. Basketball in the state of Illinois two years in a row, and he pulled him away from the Illini. So that that's a that's a win for him right there. That that's a good one. All these other good players, for the most part, are guys that he has got to transfer in. They've not yes. been people he has has recruited and developed uh, outside of Kyle Young. Kyle Young, Kyle Young is the one exception. And Dwayne Washington Jr. is another one, but I think the verdict on him, we need to see Dwayne have a more consistent season next season. When he's good, he's real good. But when he's bad, it's – it's uh, He's bad. It, it's, you need to take the basketball out of his hands bad type of thing. Um, that being said, if you look at next year's recruiting, we've got – well, first off, Let's give him credit for this. Michi Johnson was supposed to be in next year's class, and so he, but he got like basically a free year as the as a a bench warmer backup point guard. And I think he takes a, a solid role next year in replacing C.J. Walker at the point guard position. But you've got Malik Branham coming in next year, six four, hundred seventy five pound, ranked 29th nationally. He's a shooting guard from St. Vincent St. Mary in Akron, Ohio. That should sound familiar to you because that is the school where one LeBron James went. So this is the best player to come out of St. Vincent St. Mary's since LeBron. There you go. And he's ranked in in the top 30 nationally. Biggest recruit he's had. Um, And then he's got Kalen Etzler from uh, the Cincinnati area, I believe, coming in next year, who's a 6'8", 195-pound power forward who can shoot. But he's a stick, and he's got to develop. That kid going to take some time to develop. He has not, however, recruited a stud point guard, although Michi Johnson, give him, give him some years here, nor has he recruited a great big man. And that is the gaping holes on this team. Um, that's what he's got to go get. 
He's got to go get that. Now, he might you know try to do I'm that in the transfer to? portal. He might do it through transfer portal. I mean, at this point, you, that seems to be his, his go-to. But you still got to be able to recruit against the big boys. I mean, we all you – know go you ahead, know Nick. My first call to? Sure, let's hear it. Dad Mata. Well, okay. For, for what purpose? To come back and coach? Nope. Where'd you find the Jared Sullinger and Aaron Crafts oh, at? Those, those were all – okay. I'm glad you brought that up because Thad Mata was a very good – if you go and you look at the top 10 recruited basketball athletes at Ohio State history, Thad Mata recruited all but one, which was like um, Kustos or what, what was his name? Um, Costa Kufos. Costa Kustos. Costa Kufos. I met that was, him, by the way. I know him. Uh, actually, no, I take that back. That was two. That, that was uh, – that was uh, – yeah, that's him. Okay, look at this list. I just pulled it up. Greg Oden, B.J. Mullins, Jaron Sullinger, Daquan Cook, Costa Kufas, William Buford, D'Angelo Russell, Deshaun Thomas, Mike Conley, and Kata Bates-Diop. Who, who, who recruited all ten of those guys? Dad Mata. Dad Mata recruited all ten of them. That's, that's all I'm saying. Just give him a call. Hey, where was your, like, who was your recruiting guy? Who was your main guy out there? Like, hey, we need to look at these guys. You know what I mean? I'm like, sure. where did you find these I'm kids sure it was him and his kids? staff. I mean, they're, I mean, oh, yeah. but uh, it's just, there's a, there's a lot going on right now. And there was a movement. I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but there was a, there was a time and it happened at the end of Thad Mata's career when he had some bad basketball teams and wasn't even making the NCAA tournament where he he was going after the one and dones so he had like the, these these really talented freshmen who played one year and were really good but they were the only good player on the team and then would leave and there was this movement of we need a developer we need a develop we need someone who's going to recruit he's not going to recruit the top top you know 25 guys in the country but he'll recruit Ohio, who get the second best guy and the third best guy from Ohio, because the first best guy from Ohio normally is going to go to North Carolina, Duke, Kansas, you name it, right? But the next, the next tier of guys in Ohio, that model wasn't even sniffing them. Those guys were going to Xavier, Cincinnati, uh, Michigan, Michigan State. Um, they, those guys weren't even going to Ohio State because he was out there trying to chase tail in the top national blue McDonald's All American blue chippers. And he, and he was failing. He would get one and then fail. Now, the reason Thad Mata gave for why that was happening was because he was doing it right and he wasn't paying athletes through the shoe companies. You guys remember all that? Kansas yeah. was yeah. doing that and, you know, Louisville got in trouble for that. And, I mean, they were right. they were paying their it's guys. The, yeah, they oh, they still are. Uh, they were paying right. their guys through shoe companies. And Thad Motto was like, I ain't doing that. And so he would lose out on those guys, but then he wasn't taking the right approach locally in state. And I think that's why he got fired, okay, o- outside of the health issues. And so then they bring in Chris, Chris Holtman, which was a really wise decision to do that because Chris Holtman, coming from Butler, Midwest guy, Indiana roots, right? Kentucky roots. The, the guy's got his pulse on the area and he knows how to get that next best guy and develop him. Okay. Well, here's the problem. It's not really happened that way. He's, he's done it through, through the transfer portal. And I mean, how many guys did he recruit that came to Ohio state in one year and then transferred? That's been the issue. He's got to learn how to, to, to nab the guys he wants and then keep them here. And I think he can because I think he's a good coach. And I think he knows what he's doing. But today's athlete's just a little different. The best way to do this is to go out and get one blue chipper every year. I mean one stud and then get, get program builders around him. So that when those program builders are juniors and seniors, you've got that stud freshman sophomore – a la EJ Liddell, and then you've got a really good role players around him. That's how you make a, a winner in college basketball today. 
And I think that's really what their game plan is. I just don't know how successful he is at hitting the bullseye on that. But that's just my two cents with that and, and getting into a little bit of the recruiting with it. But let's talk a he little bit about needs, uh, He also needs to find his John Diebler here in Ohio. Yeah, no kidding. Right? Lights out shooter. <laughs> I don't think it's Arns either. <laughs> we'll see. No. We'll see. Um, let's talk a little bit then about next season. The roster coming back next year. So I – C.J. Walker's already let everybody know that he's not coming back. He's graduated. He's ready to start the next chapter of his life. Kyle Young has not made an announcement on that yet. He can come back for a a fifth year and be what's called a super senior given the COVID year if he wants. But let's just say he's done. Let's just say he's graduated and he's moved on. Coming back next year, you still have Dwayne Washington Jr., who will be a senior – Justice Suing, who will be a senior. Seth Towns, who will be a fifth-year senior. You have EJ Liddell, who will be a junior. Musa Jala, who will be a senior. You've got Michi Johnson Jr., who will be a redshirt freshman. This year we count as a redshirt for him. Zed Key, who will be a true sophomore. Those are your building pieces around him. And then, like I said, you've got the incoming freshman, uh, five-star blue chipper, Coming in next year from St. Vincent, St. Mary, Malik Branham, who might he might be good enough to start. That's that's what they're saying. Next year's expectations, Chris, for this team. Go. Well, I'll tell you, I, I would expect a lot out of them because we've got that senior leadership. You know, the core guys are really coming back. Yeah, um, I think Kyle Young coming back, if he would, would really put them in a in a position where I would expect, literally expect a Big Ten title out of them. Um, without Kyle Young, I still would say they would have to finish top top three in the Big Ten. Yeah. And um, I'm going to say minimum of Sweet 16. Okay. Nick, your expectations next year. Mm-hmm. Realistically, I agree uh, with Chris. I, I think top three in the Big Ten without Kyle Young. If he Kyle Young does come back, I agree as well. I expect a Big Ten championship to be coming back to Columbus. Um, and then moving on to the Big Ten tournament, um, I without Kyle Young, um, again, I I think we could be an Elite Eight team because we'll have a lot of experience and that plays a lot in college sports, a lot than more than a lot of people think, especially when you're going up against the Dukes, uh, the Kentuckys of college basketball, the Kansas, that get your one-and-done athletes. The, those freshmen don't have the experience that our seniors and juniors will. And that, you know, and that matters. So I think, like, legitimately, no matter what, I think we could be an Elite Eight, uh, potentially on the cusp of a Final Four team, uh, just depending on how well they're playing basketball next year. My expectations is to compete for a Big Ten championship, either win it or you're right on the door and you just fell short and sweet 16. If you don't do that, Chris Holtman needs to be fired. That's my expectations as a fan. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to dive into the EJ Liddell and uh, and fan situation. We're going to take it from a different approach, however. We're going to look at this a little different, so hang tight. Thanks for listening to the OHIO podcast. Would you please help us and subscribe, review, and share our podcast from your favorite podcasting platform? This greatly helps us grow our show and reach more Buckeye fans like you. Also, please visit our website at theohiopodcast.com and follow us on the following social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also email the show at theohiopodcast at gmail.com. Once again, thanks for listening and go back. Welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. All right, let's let's do this. I mean, we I don't want to beat a dead horse, and this is definitely something that everybody has talked about on every podcast imaginable and every radio station. But we saved it especially for this conversation. And Nick, I'm going to go ahead and read what you wrote 
on um, Facebook, if that's okay. Please, please. And, and please. then um, I want um, – which, by the way, uh, Nick, your post has gone viral. I didn't know if you knew that or not. Oh, I – what? That's, yeah. It what? has been – it has been it has been seen and shared quite a bit, my friend. So – um. And responded no, to really, I gotta yeah. check this out right it's now. It's the number one. It's the it's the highest, one of the highest posts we've ever had on our Facebook uh, fan page. Here's what it says: <clears throat> Hey, I've seen a lot of bashing in some comments towards our young athletes at Ohio State. Let's all remember some things here. Number one, we are fans. Keep it about the game and no personal attacks on on any player or coach. Number two, they are just kids trying their best. Number three, and most importantly. We're all Buckeyes. We support our own through the thick and thin. And then he ends it with OH. Um, you also commented on this by saying, I've seen, I have not seen it in this group. And I thank every one of you uh, to living up to the community standards we have set for this page. You are all wonderful Buckeyes. Let's continue to keep it friendly and about our Buckeyes. So I would like to say this, Nick. Thank you for making that comment, number one. Number two, thank you to all those who are listening to this podcast who are a part of our, our face group fan page um, for not being trolls, okay? So for those who maybe uh, who are listening to this podcast and you're wondering, what are you talking about? I I don't follow Ohio State on other sites, and so I don't know what, what you're even speaking of. Following the loss to Oral Roberts, EJ Liddell received some – terrible comments directed towards him on social media. I believe it was Instagram, I believe is what uh, platform these happen yeah. on. Is, it, is either that or Twitter, but I'm pretty sure it's Instagram. Twi- uh, Twitter. Twitter? Okay. I, I apologize. I thought it was Instagram. Anyways, he received um, to the point where they were death threats. I mean, heinous, hateful things thrown his direction. Um. EJ Liddell then makes he, – he copies them and, and reposts them or retweets them, I guess is what it's called on Twitter, basically saying, I'm just a human being. What have I done to deserve this? And then he shows everybody what those tweets at, directed towards him were. They were so bad, in fact, that uh, Gene Smith responded – by turning these tweets over to the authorities and the Ohio State University is seeking legal ramifications to the individual or individuals who posted these death threats on social media towards E.J. Liddell. And the basis for those death threats were the fact that when we were up four, I believe it was, E.J. was on the free throw line and the front and missed the front end of a one and one, which could have pretty much put the game out of reach at that point at the end of regulation and he missed them and gave oral roberts that open door to make a comeback so given that situation and scenario number one uh, i guess i don't want to ask the question if ej handled it right or not because i don't know that there is a right or wrong way to handle it but given that situation Chris, what is your expectations moving forward in this situation? Like, are you for Gene Smith and and the university going to law enforcement and trying to throw the book at this guy? Like, are you for that? Well, I tell you, let me just say first of all, and I know you said you didn't want to necessarily frame it this way, but I think EJ handled himself tremendously. Uh, you know, a lot of guys would have got on there and maybe said something ignorant right back at these idiots, but he did not do it. Correct. He handled himself like a man and like an ambassador of this university. And I think that he, you know, first of all, credit needs to go out to him for that. I do like the fact that the university has his back. I think it's great that we saw Coach Day tweet out. We saw Gene Smith take an action. Um, so I love the fact that these guys are involved, the other players on the football team and the other athletes are involved saying, hey, you know what? This is ridiculous. This needs to stop. Mm-hmm. Legally, I think we're in kind of some unprecedented waters here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's like, are we attacking First Amendment? Well, no, I don't think we are attacking the First Amendment by going after them 
legally simply because they made menacing threats to the young man on social media. Do I necessarily think it needs to go through the courts? I don't know. Uh, if we find out it comes back to a student or something like that, I think there's other other things that could be done. Right. Um, as far as going through the, uh, as opposed to going through the courts. I also think, first of all, these were not fans that were making these comments. These are mostly, I mean, they may say they were fans. I think it's a lot more likely that these guys who lost money on the office pool are betting on games. Right. Who just got ignorant and, and pissed off and decided to do this. Um, so, yeah. Do I think that there needs to be legal ramification? I don't know. I'm kind of iffy on that. Um, however, I do like the fact that the university is, you know, supporting him and showing him, hey, we got your back on this. Yeah, I'm going to double on double down on that, Chris, by saying this. I think... Even though legally there might not be a lot that they can do, um, if they find out who it is, if they're able to find out who it is, what the university can do is ban him from all Ohio State activities. Absolutely. And if you're a true fan, boy, that would be the worst possible thing is to have your fandom stripped from you to where you can never attend a game. Like you are banned. Yeah, that's worse than any fine or 30-day lockup they would give him for – Right. Yeah. And so I'm all for that. If the, if that if that is able to happen, beautiful. Go for it. I will celebrate that. Nick, I know you're passionate about this. I'm going to just kind of step away and give you the floor here. Take this baby whichever way you want because this conversation is eventually going to get into the role of social media as a fan. And we're going to we're going to talk about that's how we're going to end this show. But given the the, the situation with EJ first off Go for it, man. Just go for it. <laughs> First off, my personal opinion, and I want to, I, I have friends who are gay. I have friends who are black. That uh, I have friends who are both. That type of talk has no place in our society. Has literally no place in our society, especially the young men who are athletes doing their best. And when you threaten them like that and you, and you say things like that, and then you put like put threats into it, 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 to me, you have to be a very sick and disgusting human being to even get on to any sort of platform and like, and, and logically think this is something I should send to a 20 year old kid. Um, like that, I, to me, I just can't believe like adults or anybody who is just thinking like, oh, I should probably send this to a 20 year old kid. Now, if it's another 20 year old kid, I kind of get it because, you know, we're all 20. We don't think our, we were all 20 once. We all know what that mindset was like. You don't think your words have, you know, your words, tweets, whatever, have any ramifications or whatever. Right. Um, but like, if it was an adult who did it, I just can't. I just can't believe what type of human being would 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 do that. Um, as far as the university has handled things and how EJ handled himself, it, I can't think of any other way I would have wanted him to handle that. It just it, like what it, it, he just sent it out there. Hey, am I not a human being, guys? Like, like what did I do to deserve this? I'm just playing a game. You know, um, I, I mean, and at the bottom line of it, as as fans and everything, they want this way more than we do. Like, we all have to remember that at some that sometimes like they're the ones who put the sweat, the blood, the workout, their time, our football team team just sacrificed more than most of us could ever imagine just so that way they could go out there and do what they love to do and be with their brothers on the team doing it and then we and then we have people who react like that to a simple kid doing what he thought was best in that scenario playing a game that he loves i i just it, it just literally blows my mind eric that 
that stuff like that still happens in today's society. And the way the university came to his came to his call when they saw one of our one of our Buckeyes being hurt speaks volumes to what our university really does stand for. What we have these, we have your back. We see something going on. We're coming to you. You know, like I said, we are Buckeyes. No matter where we all are, you can run into a Buckeye out in California and he'll treat you like he's your next, like he's known you in your entire life because we're Buckeyes and that's what we do. We take right. care of our own through the thick and thin and we support each other no matter what. Yeah. One of the things I love about this this fandom of being a Buckeye, and you well, well said, first off, Nick, is the fact that no matter what political party you might support, or what background you come from or social economic standard you might have or not have in your life. When someone yells out OH, you respond with IO and there's a brotherhood there. There's a kinship there that transcends all of those other social economic uh, divisions in our society. And so I love that. And I love being a part of that. And this attacked that. That this attack on EJ wasn't necessarily about EJ. It was attack on that, on our on our fandom, and and I see it all the time on social media, and that's where I want to take the direction of this because it's okay to be critical of your team. It's okay. You can be. We do it every week on the, on this podcast, Nick. I mean, every week, Aaron and I, Chris and I, you and I, we criticize the team. Of what they're doing or what they're not doing. But what we but, don't do is we don't threaten and, and personally attack someone on a personal level. Now, I can. it's fine for me to talk about the, the what EJ Liddell doesn't do right on the basketball court and what what he failed to do. But that doesn't mean he's not trying. You're, that does, you're it's analyzing not, a game. Right. You're, you're, not, you're not out here calling this kid – racial slurs this or that you know what i mean like we're people we're talking about what they're doing on the court like plenty of conversations i've had with you and aaron tough borland too slow too yeah. slow we're not out there we're not, i'm not out there personally attacking him i'm just saying he's too slow to play that position at linebacker for us right now against this team <laughs> I, sorry go ahead though eric i i it was just, I mean, I mean, I'm just saying, like, that, that I took the attack personally for EJ because as a fan, I feel like we are misunderstood. I feel like the Ohio State fan base is misunderstood. We get a lot of slack as being the most annoying fan base in sports. Did you guys know that? We were voted oh. number one. We were voted the number one most hated fans in all of sports. That includes the oh, Yankees. Yeah. That includes Clearly, Philadelphia never, fans. They've oh, never I'll tell you why. In Boston, obviously. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you why right now. I was in I was in Daytona, Florida, after we lost that 06 national championship game to Florida. You know what we were doing? Out. You know what? The first first morning I woke up at our hotel on the balcony. You know what I? Guess what song I heard, Eric? Probably "Hang On, Sloopy." Yep. And everybody from the pool all the way up the balconies of their hotel were screaming O H I O. Beautiful. So, so here's 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 the the underlying sick truth. And there's an article on um, in, that was from a, the a Canton newspaper uh, from a um, Char Charita Gaucher, I guess I pronounced that correctly. Um, that gets to the root of it. And it, that this all of this boils down to gambling, essentially, is what it, is what they're finding out. That the people who are doing this are losing great sums of money in gambling, and so they they lash out because of what they've lost. Listen to some of these statistics. Are you ready for this, guys? Seventy five percent of college students gamble. Seventy five percent. I don't know about you guys, but when I was in college, I didn't have money to gamble, man. <laughs> the, 
me that's, and college would be a lot cheaper nowadays than when I went to it because I wasn't having money to gamble with. No kidding. Okay, I actually did a I did a paper on this for one of my addictions classes. And yeah, you'd be surprised. And as you go through the demographics by um, various ethnicities and things, you'll find that certain ethnicities have an even a higher propensity than the 75% of college students. Wow. I think like Asian college students were somewhere near 90%. Really? <laughs> yes. That's staggering. Anyways, I, I, I know that's kind of a little bit of a side nugget there to, the, to what we're getting at, but I, if you like, I, I, I you know, I'm never. I'm not going to say I've never gambled in my life. I, I will say this: I've never been to a casino before, um, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. People, I know people. I have a lot of friends and family who do who go to casinos, and I've got a real good friend who's like literally. He goes, I go to the casino because the buffet there is amazing. That's all. That's right. He's, he's like, not lying. <laughs> he's like, I play penny slots. I play penny slots, and I go eat, man. It's awesome. But um, <clears throat> I've I I've I've been to horse races before. That's a lot of fun. That's just an experience, mm-hmm. you know, to not even know who you're really, you know, putting a couple bucks on. <laughs> you're just for the fun of it. You know, I like the green. I like the jockey in the green who's you know, going to be uh, driving that uh, black horse. I mean, whatever. <clears throat> but if you are to the point where, like, you have to lash out because you have lost so much money on a basketball game. <sighs> It's in. It's getting out of hand, and I know it's big money, and that's why that's why you talk about the the betting line on every game now, because it's just big money, and that's unfair to these kids. But let's get to let's get to the point here. Can, can I, I say something real quick? Yep, yeah, real quick. Just regarding about that about that easiest fix: no gambling on college sports. Take it off of Las Vegas books. Never happen. It will never, never happen. Too much. It money will never happen. But that's the fix. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Oh, I'm for you. Um, <clears throat> all right. So here's the thing. This is why it was so upsetting to me because I I feel that we as a fan base are misunderstood, and Ohio State fans are so passionate about the Buckeyes, and there's nothing wrong with that, and there's nothing wrong with getting on Facebook or Twitter or whatever and being like, man, so-and-so stunk, I'm so upset, you know, or Coach Coach Day, made, he's just not the guy. Or I mean, listen, how many times do we hear about Kerry Combs is not a very good defensive coordinator? I mean, people do that all the time, and it's okay. It's okay to let some fans vent like that. That's how they're venting, okay? The response back to those type of posts are what killed me. You're not a true Buckeye fan. Um, I bleed scarlet and gray every day. And, and no win, lose, or draw, I'm a Buckeye till I die. And you, you're you not a real fan if you're not supporting them. Well, guess what? <clears throat> guess what? If Ohio State goes, starts going 9-3 and three every year in football, am I going to quit being a fan? No. I'm going to demand better from the football team. Just like we just did with Chris Holtman. We put expectations on him for next year. Did we not just do that? Absolutely. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. So to to the Karen in the cul-de-sac who wants to get on Facebook <laughs> and tell me that I'm not a oh, true God. fan, <laughs> please, uh, okay? Uh, <laughs> Simmer down. Simmer right. down. Now, let me let me take it to the next step here, okay? There is a there's a place and time to vent and there's that's okay, but you have to have a line drawn in the sand that you will not go to that next level of venting. What is that next level of venting? It's when you then personally attack that person. That is the line you cannot cross as a fan. And everybody talks about in every fan base, there's always that 1% or 2% of crazies who will, who will go past that line. And that's the line that I have drawn on our social media pages and on Facebook and on our website and in our podcast. The personal attacks won't happen. Now, I will personally attack your play. 
I will personally say you did not do this right or you didn't do good, but I will not attack you personally based off of your ethnicity, your religion, your your sexual preference, whatever. That I won't do. I will attack your play or the lack thereof, but I will not attack you as a person. That's the difference. And what social media does is it gives the, the platform to everybody – to then cross that line. What you had to what you used to have to do in the 90s and early 2000s, you had to sit down and pen a letter and then mail it to that person or say it to their face. You couldn't get on on your phone and quickly type it out to them. Because of that platform now, it has given a voice to what used to be a voiceless fan who was an idiot. Now it gives them a platform. Let's have that discussion. Is social media good or bad? In my, I, I guess we, I, we will both say it's both, right? It's both good and bad. Good because it gives us more access to the athlete and to find out who they are as a person. Bad because it gives the idiot access to them to then cross that line. Chris, you're in this field, man. You you see this kind of stuff in real life taking place in people's lives. What role has social media played for people? Well, like you said, it can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. Um, social media attacks and bullying are definitely the, the downfall of, of social media as far as that goes. Um, I mean, we've seen teenagers commit suicide because they've been attacked on social social media um we see things on social media disparaging other people because of as you said race or socioeconomic uh status um but you know overall i think the social media is valuable it provides a great service um i think as far as as you said access to other people, um, uh, you know, that we might not otherwise have access to as far as the athletes go. It provides us a great uh, platform for what we are doing here right now um, and getting the word out. Business-wise, it gives it gives uh, a small store like myself the ability to, to um, for, for myself and Vicky to, to put our product out yeah, there. Advertise, yeah. Advertise. Um, so, yeah, I think social media has a lot of great aspects. Now, what you do have to watch is, as like in your case as an administrator on a page, is I think we then have a responsibility somewhat to make sure that that abuse isn't happening on our pages. Um, so I do think there is an increased responsibility there. Um, I think that in some cases, on some formats, um, you know, and whether you, you liked him or disliked him, um, the president's access to Twitter, I think, brought a lot of um, a lot of monitoring from the social media sites um, into play. And, and whether people consider that fair or not, I don't necessarily know that it was a bad thing, um, as long as it's even handed. So social media overall, I think, is a great thing. During this, I, I'll tell you, during this pandemic, I don't know if my daughter would have made it through without having social media com to communicate with her friends. Um, because, as I said, there was a great increase in depression, especially among teenagers, during this, this pandemic. And I think social media was actually beneficial uh, in the fact that it did allow them to communicate and it probably kept some people from being far more isolated than they would have been. So social media is not bad. What people do with social media sometimes is what is bad. Nick, social media and sports, man, go for it. So you guys actually covered, I mean, pretty much everything. Um, I The only thing that I would like to add um, that that I think would – not necessarily be a bad thing for athletes, especially college athletes to start doing is privatizing your account. 
um, making, you know, as much as you want to be out there and you want to get in touch with your fan base and, you know, you're in college, you're having a good time, uh, privatizing that account, making it harder for those people like EJ Liddell experience harder to get in contact with you, harder for you to see it. Um, cause you know, all that weighs down on your mental health as well. When you see the negative, um, you know, the positive, you know, there's so many positives to social media. Uh, but I think in the sports world, especially in college, uh, fellas, keep those accounts private, keep it to your close friends and family, like people, you know, uh, make it harder for, you know, those, uh, excuse the language, those a-holes, uh, I don't, uh, you know, those a-holes to get in touch with you. Um, cause you know, uh, you guys don't deserve it. You don't need to hear it. Um, it may be out there, but like they don't deserve it. You know, that they, they don't need to see that stuff. Let, let these idiots tweet it to somewhat like tweet it to a fake account or something, you know? Um, and I think as much as that would take away from us fans who like follow Justin Fields, uh, you know, it gets to you know, and like you said, Eric, it's good because some of us fans really get to know these kids on a personal level. Um, as much as I would think, I, I think it's really kind of what's best for the kids at that point. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. Social media is only going to get bigger, guys, because as the as the NCAA allows these guys to profit from their name, image, and likeness, they're going to do that through social media. That's how they're going to get followers and get recognized and, and, and all of that. And so they're just going to have to be more careful at who they allow to, you know, reply to them. You know, that's that's going to be going to be very interesting. And as we get into the next few years with that is the role that social media will play and 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 them being able to. um make money off of themselves because they're not the, the university is not going to pay these athletes. That's not going to happen. These athletes, I think the NCAA is going to allow them, award them the ability to make money themselves off of who they are as themselves. But that check won't be coming through the university. I promise you, um, because then that changes everything of what, um, what then you're, then you're just amateur athletes. Yeah, you're no longer an amateur athlete. You're you're a professional then at that point. Yeah, you're you're just you're, exactly. And then and then Ohio State is your employer, and that's right. not what they are no. they're going to want for colleges. So and, and you know what, I I don't have a problem with the with the athlete going out and like if he's doing like an autograph signing, and he wants to charge for it. Yeah, that's his that's his thing. Well, let him. You know, I don't have a problem with him making money off of that. But like the the sure. unit, I, I just. I can't think the university should pay them. Right. Yep. Um, good discussion, guys. Good. That's good discussion. All right. Let's do this. Let's finish up with this. I've got some news for everybody. We have, we, we threw it out there. Chris and I talked about it. We threw it out there on our Facebook page this week. Um, as far as, um, doing a 64 movie NCAA tournament bracket style, a tournament of sports movies, and I'm not going to announce the brackets tonight. We are going to do that this Sunday. Chris and I are going to do that as part of uh, episode 144. I did email the brackets today. They are finished, and I emailed them to the guys so they can take a look at it. Um, let's let's talk about one bracket tonight. Let's let's wet everybody's whistle. Which one do you guys want to talk about? There's four brackets: football, basketball, baseball, or sports. Give me a second. I gotta. Go to your email and open one up. Which one do you want to talk about, Chris? I'll I'll tell you, we are in basketball season still, technically, so I kind of feel like we got to go there. Okay, let's do that. So let's open up the basketball bracket. So here's how I did this, everybody. Uh, Here's here's how I did this. So I asked everybody, hey, give me some movies. And I wrote all those movies down. If if, If more than one person said, hey, I like this movie, I tried to make sure I put those in the the tournament. So movies that received more than like one mention or movies that quite frankly I think were more popular or I've heard of before because I don't want to have to watch 64 movies. Um, 
but I only wanted to watch a handful, maybe. So there are there are some that I've never seen before. I'm gonna have to watch, and there are a few some that I want to go rewatch as we go through work our way through this, Chris. But let's talk about the basketball bracket. So here's how I did this. I then took those 16 movies and I went to a site called Flickchart that you can sign up for. It's free and you can rate, rate and rank all the movies you've ever seen. I've been a part of this website for years now. And there's a spot in there when you pull up a movie. It gives you what's called uh, – it's, it's, um, it's ranking as far as like how it ranks – the with every every movie there is okay um based off of their uh, algorithm there where they where they char- uh, talk about um all the movies so there there's there's a system to this it's not just one person's opinion it's it's everybody's opinion together so that being said 1 through 16 just like the NCAA basketball tournament the number one seed in the basketball bracket is Hoosiers. Okay. Number two surprised me. He got game. It was actually the next highest ranked basketball movie on flip chart. And it goes one through 16, all the way down to the 16th movie rebound, which I've never seen. I'll have to watch that one. Um, but here, here are the matchups in the first round. Hoosiers, one seed rebound, 16th seed. The 9 8 game, or 8 9 game, Glory Road and Above the Rim. Oh. The 5 12 game, this is hilarious. Oh, Space Jam, air up, air up there. The 13 4 game, The Way Back, a, a new basketball movie, and Teen Wolf, an old basketball movie. The 3 14, <laughs> this is talk about interesting. White Men Can't Jump versus Air Bud. The 11-6 game, semi-pro <laughs> versus Coach Carter. The 7-10 game, love, uh, love and basketball versus Blue Chips. And the 15-2 game, the sixth man, and he got game. Mark it down. That one might surprise everybody. Um, which, I think Hoosiers is a really strong number one seed in this bracket. But which of those opening round games, Chris, jumps out at you as this could be an upset? Oh, I'll, I'll tell you, I like that 5-12 matchup. Yeah. 5-12 you think, and the 7-10 both, I think, could be. Yes, 7-10 was mine. I think Blue Chips can, I think Blue Chips can beat Love in basketball. I do, too. I also think a semi-pro has got a chance to beat Coach Carter, but oh. that is one of the games, one of the movies I've never seen. So that one is on my list Which this one? week. Coach Carter. Oh. What? I've never seen you it. You don't know. The- oh After my you goodness! Watch that movie. I want to hear your opinion of the rich man of rich men. Oh, Eric. I. Hey, I. T- oh. Hey, I've seen every other. I've seen ev- Well, no, I take that back. I've not seen Love in Basketball. That is on my list too. Um, okay. Which is a good movie. It is so, a good movie. It's a good movie. Well, I've seen the rest of them. And oh well, take that back. Rebound. I've never seen Rebound. So there's there, oh. and that's on my list too. There are three basketball movies I need to go watch this weekend. But uh, anyways, I've got Coach Carter downstairs already, fired up in the DVR for this weekend. So that one's gonna get watched. But. Uh, yeah, I think that 10-7 game too, Chris. I agree with you. Uh, Nick, any anything jump out at you on this bracket that you think could Up, be an upset right away? Upset right away, definitely the 7-10. Um, yep. I just know a lot of people's opinion on love and basketball, so that, that's the one. I have to disagree with Chris. Jordan saving the Looney Tunes is taking home the championship. <laughs> Come on, I'm not even sure it can get past the Jimmy Dolan shake and bake. Oh, this is yeah. hilarious. Like, my guy, my guy reached his arm from half court. Slam dunk, baby. Uh, okay, so I, I, I'm i just going to tell you guys, I, I think Hoosiers, it's going to be hard to beat, man. I would agree. I think Hoosiers is going to be hard to beat in this bracket. That's I think, one of my favorites. In fact, out of all the number one seeds, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about that here. We're going to talk about that Sunday, Chris. Out of all the number one seeds, Hoosiers is the strongest number one, in my opinion. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Um, in fact, it'll be very interesting to me when it gets to when Hoosiers gets to about 
Well, the second round game will be interesting. Above the Rim and Glory Road are both really good movies. Um, are they Hoosiers? I don't know, but we'll see. So here's how this is going to work. We're going to pu- do one matchup per day starting Monday, okay? So we will do one matchup from from a bracket every day. So, like, for instance, we'll start with basketball on Monday, and I'll throw the movies out there. I'll throw one movie, one of these matchups out there. It might be – so it might be Hoosiers versus Rebound on Monday. And then Tuesday, we'll go to a different bracket. We'll either go football – or, or baseball bracket, or we'll go to the uh, sports bracket, which is all sports movies that aren't basketball, baseball, or football. And we'll do one matchup per day and allow you, the listeners, to vote. And you are 33% of the final score. Your vote will count 33%, one-third. And then Chris's vote and my vote each will be 33% on the show live okay on sunday so we'll know what you say but you won't know what we think and so if chris or myself agree with you the fans then that doesn't matter what the other person thinks so for instance if if the majority of you think rebound is better than hoosiers and then come sunday chris says you know what i watched rebound it's a better movie than hoosiers and I'm like, you guys are crazy. Hoosiers is the is by far the best movie. Doesn't matter that I think that rebound would rebound will win. That's how we're gonna do it. However, if 33% of you think rebound or, or excuse me, if the majority of you think rebound is better than Hoosiers, but Chris and I disagree with you, then we are gonna then our two votes will count more than yours. That's how this is gonna go. So you are you the listeners are collectively a third. Chris is a third, and I'm a third. And we are going to do four movies a week, one from each bracket, until we get to the final four, which will be sometime around, if I did my math, around when Ohio State football begins. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait. Chris and I, I think Chris is a movie buff like me, so he's probably seen a lot of these movies. Oh, yeah. And I'll talk with you, I'll talk with Chris beforehand. We'll make sure. Hey, have you seen both of these? And if we say if one of us says no, we'll pass so that we give ourselves time to either a find that movie, rent it from the library, or whatever, so we get to watch it. Sound good, Chris? I have every streaming service known to man, so and I. a huge cle- and a huge collection of DVDs. We got this. Okay. And like I said, the library in Delaware is pretty good at giving me a movie if I can't find it. So I've, I've gone through my list, and out of all the 64 movies, I think there's only eight that I've never seen. So, And they're on my list. I've already sent them to my library, and they're, they're on their way to me. So I'm going to get every one of them here. Nick, any, anything in this bracket that jumps out to you? I mean, minus Hoosiers, if Hoosiers doesn't win, which basketball movie is going to win this bracket? If if it's not Hoosiers, if it's not Hoosiers, if Hoosiers gets upset two, by a movie, which one will it be? There's only two movies I could think that would upset Hoosiers: okay. Space Jam and White Man Can't Jump. Okay. White Man White Man Can't Jump is a three seed, and Space Jam was a five seed. Chris, I, what movie on here can upset Hoosiers? Um, you, you know what? Well, like I said, whether it's my choice or not, I do believe Space Jam has a strong following, as Nick said. Um, I'll tell you, I I really love Coach Carter. I think it's a great movie, and I think it could make a run. Okay, if there's one movie on here, I think that that people will gravitate towards our list. If I know our listeners, like I think I do. The one movie on here that can give it can give Hoosiers a run for its money. Don't say it. I don't think it could beat it, but maybe if there's one movie on here, I think it's Blue Chips. I, I love it. Yeah, I, I mean, think it might be Blue Chips. Yeah. I there's that college feel to that movie, man. It's got Shaq. It's got Penny. Uh, did it have Eric Montross in it? Was that who was in it? Who was the big white guy in Blue Chips? Uh, no, it was. Uh... Who was what that? was his name? I thought it was, was Eric the... Montrose. No. It was uh you, oh, I can't you know what, name now. 
you know what part of that movie I, I sticks out to me the most is when the like the it was, I think there's a scene where the coach throws the basketball at the mascot. <laughs> and then, and then, I know there's one where he, he I know there's one where he kicks it up in the stands. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think there's one where he throws the ball at the mascot. It's like a dolphin or something, and he like hits it in the head, Matt or Nover. one of the players does. Matt Nover was the big the big guy. Okay, yeah, good movie, good movie. Anyways, um, <laughs> hey, by the way, I'm gonna say this, and people are probably gonna be mad. Blue Chips is the program of basketball. The the program, the movie. It's blue chip yeah. the basketball version. Hands down. It is. All right, guys, that's our show, man. We got to get out of here. This thing went a bit <laughs> way longer than I thought it would be. So that's, we're ra- that's our wrap up for basketball. Chris and I are going to be back into Ohio state football, like up to our ears on Sunday, as we continue talking about spring football, lots to talk about there. Hopefully you feel positive as a Ohio state fan for, after listening to us. Hey, don't feel bad. Don't let the two percent get to you or the Karen in the cul-de-sac. Like I said, they they are who they are, man. You keep being a Buckeye. You keep doing you, man. We're gonna get this thing. That we're, I I think Chris Holtman is gonna get this thing right next year. I've got a good feeling. I got some positive vibes that Chris Holtman in that basketball program is gonna be on top of the Big Ten in 2021, man. 2022. I feel it. I feel it. Nick, thanks for joining us, brother. Appreciate it, man. Hey, thanks for having me on, fellas. Appreciate your uh, appreciate your fandom and being a part of the of the podcast and our group. And Chris, as always, man, thanks for being there for us. And I hope you're enjoying your spring break, brother. Oh, we're loving it here. So beautiful. As long as I don't have to clean up any more trees, it's going to be a good weekend. <laughs> that <that's, laughs> sounds like that might be what's going to happen. We, we shall see. We're we're batting down the hatches here, folks. Batting down the hatches. All right, guys, that's our show. As always, be kind to one another. I owe someone's OH in Sin Carmen, Ohio, with all your heart. And until next time, OH! Oh! Go, Bucks! Oh, come, let's sing, oh. Hios praise and songs through armor while our hearts rebounding thrill and joy which death alone can still summer's heat or winter's cold the seasons pass the years will roll time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship oh hi yo